This week on the Back Table Podcast. So the most important uh, determinant is the kidney function. If the GFR is less than 30, 30, then we typically do not want to remove more than 6 liters of, uh, of uh, fluid, and we will always give them intravenous albumin. So our practice, as well as that of our IR colleagues, is if anybody requires more than 4 liters of paracentesis, we give them intravenous albumin, 10 gram per liter of fluid removed in order to avoid a condition called as post-paracentesis circulatory dysfunction, which leads to kidney failure and can be very catastrophic. So that's kind of the rule of thumb. Uh, in patients who have normal kidney function and have a normal blood, blood pressure, I could potentially remove up to 15 liters of fluid as long as I'm very particular, very diligent about the albumin. So if I remove 15 liters of fluid, I'll give them 150 grams of IV albumin. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular and minimally invasive. If you are a new listener, welcome. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back. Thank you for listening. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or our website, which is backtable.com. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or feel free to reach out to us on social media. Let us know how we can make this podcast better, and we'll do our best to make that happen. Let's take a moment to thank our sponsor, GI Supply. The Renova RP Paracentesis Management System by GI Supply offers a new option for your patients with recurrent ascites. This unique approach puts the focus on patient and staff satisfaction, providing a closed system alternative to vacuum bottles and wall suction that's fast and gentle. Learn more about Renovo by visiting www.rethinkparas.com. If you can't remember that website, we'll link to it in the show notes. We'll be talking today broadly about chronic liver disease and drill down a bit further into those patients with portal hypertension. Our guest today is a gastroenterologist and hepatologist out of Dallas, Dr. Parvez Mantri. Parvez, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, a pleasure to have you. All right, so let's just uh, let our audience get to know you a little bit. Um, can you talk about uh, your background, specifically what the hepatology GI training looks like? Sure, Chris. So I'm a Parvez Mantri. I'm a transplant hepatologist. I currently serve as executive medical director for the Methodist Health Systems Clinical Research Institute and a transplant hepatologist at the Methodist Dallas Medical Center. Uh, I've been in Dallas for the last 13 years and started my career in New York. I uh, did my residency at New York Medical College and then my fellowship in gastroenterology and hepatology at the University of Rochester. I stayed on back as faculty and Director of Transplant Hepatology in University of Rochester from 2003 and then moved to Dallas in 2008. So as far as like GI or gastroenterology hepatology, is that built into one fellowship? Are there two different fellowships? Or when you pick your fellowship, do you know that you want to do GI with a focus on hepatology? I never uh, knew quite how that works. Sure, Chris. No, that's a great question. Gastroenterology is the mother fellowship and hepatology is a specialized fellowship within it. So typically what people do is they, if they're interested in liver diseases and transplant medicine, they, they do three years of gastroenterology and an additional year of a hepatology fellowship. I was fortunate uh, since I did this 18 years ago to have been kind of grandfathered in the system where I did two years of gastroenterology fellowship and then in my final year, I just focused on hepatology. Let's talk about uh, chronic liver disease and just like the 3,000 foot view. Will you talk about how big of a problem this is and why like this deserves so much of your attention? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, chronic liver disease is, uh, and cirrhosis is a major public health problem in the United States and of course, all over the world. And uh, this is because the causes of chronic liver disease are ubiquitous they are very inbuilt into our uh, social lifestyle, and um, pretty much no one is immune to it. The liver is the largest visceral organ in the body and is the most important digestive organ where pretty much every food that we eat, every toxin that we ingest directly goes into the liver. And therefore, from excessive consumption of alcohol to 
excessive consumption of sugar or calories to other uh, lifestyles to immunological conditions to genetic conditions the liver can be affected by pretty much anything and everything under the sun which is why the burden of disease uh, in the united states from chronic liver disease is extremely high at any given point there's probably uh, in 2021 maybe about 40 to 50 million americans that have some form of chronic liver disease wow so in developed countries um and not to uh not pay attention to some of our listeners in other countries but Will you talk about some of the most common causes that you see in the US and specifically in your practice in Dallas? Sure, absolutely. So in the US, the most common causes of liver disease, if I were to rank them in order, are one, uh, chronic hepatitis C, uh two, alcoholic liver disease, and three, uh, a condition called as non-alcoholic liver disease or NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. and then this is followed by a bunch of other conditions like autoimmune liver diseases primary biliary cholangitis autoimmune hepatitis primary sclerosing cholangitis hemochromatosis alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency and so on and so forth but the top 3 are hepatitis c alcohol and a uh, fatty liver not caused by alcohol which is due to diabetes and obesity out of curiosity have you seen uh, basically since you started practicing hepatology to where you are today uh, a meteoric rise in uh, nash yes absolutely so in the last 20 20 years and nash uh, is is a relatively new diagnosis i mean we knew about fatty liver we just did not know honestly how serious it could get it's only in the last 15 to 20 years we have or discovered painfully so how serious a medical issue this is and what a burden it imposes on society and also uh, gives us a really uh, a strong alert on trying to find it and fix it early and uh, for for example in the 90s about 19 out of 50 states were kind of overweight which means that more than 30% of their population was obese or had a bmi greater than 30 well in 2021 i think 47 out of 50 states are considered obese in the sense that one out of three people in those states is 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 obese and when you consider the the phenomenon of ob- obesity and diabetes also called as diabetesity um about a quarter of those populations will of, of that population will have a form of progressive liver disease which we refer to as nash or non alcoholic state of hepatitis so it is pretty staggering out of curiosity you have any idea what the three states that don't fall into the obes- obesity category are i mean i would have to guess like hawaii colorado and like i don't know oregon you may be a little close but well actually hawaii has a very high obesity population oh. uh in the in the native americans it is uh, connecticut and massachusetts and i do not know the third state but uh, okay um it could be uh, anyone you pick but uh you know in where we live in texas texas alabama mississippi and louisiana are considered the four most obese states in the country and uh, they have a very substantial burden of liver disease in fact they have the highest prevalence of liver cancer and in texas we have the highest mortality from liver cancer in the entire country wow all right well that hits home i don't know if i mentioned earlier uh parvez but i practice in new orleans which you know located right in louisiana all right so let's uh shift gears a little bit and talk about uh your practice specifically when when patients present to you can you talk or speak a little bit to the work up that uh you perform for chronic liver disease and i know this is a loaded question probably it probably comes with so much and it's very dependent on like etiology but for either the trainees out there or for interventional radiologists who don't do this on a day-to-day basis can you kind of give us a brief summary of like what a, a good standard work up for cld looks like absolutely absolutely so you know the first visit when somebody comes with suspected CLD is one of my most important because I want to take a detailed history to dive in into exactly what's going on looking at all their historical records sometimes these patients may have been to other places or have had tests running 
for years, which which gives me an idea of, of the chronicity of the illness. Apart from a detailed history, and especially a very granular history of what their weight was, like five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, or how long have they been diabetic, or how what was their hemoglobin A1C over the years, or asking granular questions about really how much they drink or how much they did uh, drink in the past, and, uh, and a family history, especially in certain ethnic groups like Hispanics, it is important to know if they have strong family history of liver disease because uh, you know the, the Nash can have a genetic predisposition. And then honing into, you know, of course, any examination features. I see if they have any sarcopenia, any pedal edema, any ascites, any evidence of uh, encephalopathy. And then looking at the basic labs, assessing their child PU score, their MELD score, and then uh, cross-sectional imaging is supremely important. You're in radiology, so you probably know that very well. So, you know, an ultrasound or, or a multiphasic MRI, a lot of times in our obese patients, we want to make sure we get a multiphasic MRI to assess their vasculature, their, how their liver surface is, and importantly, to rule out cancers. And then the serological workup is extremely important. When we come, when it starts from fresh, we never take anything, we never assume anything. Mm -hmm. If they're a baby boomer, I will double check that their hepatitis panel has been checked because you know they're still likely to have hepatitis C even if they present with no risk factors whatsoever. And then we'll check uh, the autoimmune markers, smooth muscle antibody, anti-nuclear antibody. And then if they are younger and if nothing else is evident, and mind you, we don't check this in everybody, but if a 40-year-old patient comes to me with cirrhosis, I will check his ceruloplasmin and alpha-1 antitrypsin. I will check their iron studies. Uh, and uh, any other genetic markers to see if the, if they have any uh, kind of uh, genetic condition predisposing to cirrhosis. At what point does a native liver biopsy come into the workup? Is that something that at some point all patients with uh, chronic liver disease will go through, or is it on a case by case basis? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. So I think um, one of the key distinctions here is chronic liver disease versus just patients with cirrhosis and, and end-stage liver disease. I think that the conversation I was alluding to about earlier was mostly patients presenting with established cirrhosis and or some signs of liver failure in which there's, no really, there's not really any role for a further assessment of fibrosis like a liver biopsy. However, let's take a different scenario. I have a, you know, a patient just coming with me for evaluation of abnormal liver function tests, and they had an ultrasound which shows a coarse echogenic uh, liver or, uh, um, or a different echogenicity in it. Uh, in those patients, we, it is really important to assess their liver fibrosis, and we do it by one of four methods. One is a blood test called as a fibrosure, which is the least reliable, but it is readily available. Two, a fibro scan, also called a transient elastography, which we have a few machines and we use it the most commonly in order to assess the degree of liver fibrosis, which we grade from zero to four, zero being normal and four being cirrhosis. Three, now we have the ability of doing um, MR elastography, which we acquired at our center seven years ago. It's a really neat, non-invasive tool which can tell us exactly how much damage the liver has. And then number four, uh, the, the, the last but not the least important is the liver biopsy, which uh, a lot of us, in, uh, myself included, perform ourselves. It's a 10-minute procedure, but it is slightly invasive. We uh, give patients some sedation and uh, pick a spot, which is ultrasound-guided, uh, between their intercostal spaces, um, take a 16-gauge needle, take a sample, and that that is still considered the gold standard for a diagnosis of a chronic liver disease, and especially in conditions like state hepatitis, if we know that the patient does not already have full-fledged cirrhosis. Got you. And how often do patients uh, get referred for, instead of a percutaneous biopsy, a transjugular liver biopsy um, with the additional uh, you know, diagnostic benefit of like pressure measurements? That's a great question, Chris. So uh, there are a, a few conditions uh, or situations where I would prefer a transjugular liver biopsy. 
So oftentimes we will um, have a patient who does not have any obvious features of liver disease and yet comes with, say, variceal bleeding or uh, ascites. And you look, I look at their liver numbers, they're all completely normal. Of all the risk factors I pointed out, uh, the patient does not seem to have any. All the serological workup is negative. The uh, uh, ultrasound or, or CT or MRI shows a very smooth liver. And I want to find out what's wrong with the liver. Or, or, is, or is it that those conditions that I'm describing, like the ascites or the bleeding coming from a different issue, like a, a vascular issue or a completely non-related issue to the liver? In those cases, I will always perform a transjugular biopsy because my radiologist can tell me what is the hepatic venous wedge gradient. And that is, of course, an indirect measurement of the portal vein pressure. And if it is more than 12, I know that this patient has portal hypertension and is most likely cirrhotic. Uh, and of course, the biopsy will corroborate as well. If it is low, then I know that this patient has extra hepatic portal hypertension or just something else causing the features uh, that the patient came to me for evaluation of. I see. So I wanted to dig in a little bit to uh, one of the complications related for CLD, specifically portal hypertension. Um, if you want, though, can you just kind of give us a brief overview of the most common uh, complications or uh, secondary uh, issues that you run into on patients who suffer from chronic liver disease? Absolutely. So when we look at the complications of chronic liver disease, there's, we divide into two, two areas. One is those related to liver synthetic dysfunction because the liver is responsible sometimes solely for production of proteins and chemicals and clotting factors. And two is those related to portal hypertension because when the liver architecture is lost, it loses its ability to filter blood and the unfiltered blood backtracks into uh, veins which surround the stomach and esophagus as well as the spleen leading to uh, viruses because they're trying to find a way to get the blood back into the systemic circulation through the collaterals. And so those are the two main ways we, we uh, actually uh, decide, decipher the complications from liver disease. Ascites, the, which is the most ominous and the most common cause of liver uh, chronic liver disease, needs a component of both. For ascites to happen, you need portal hypertension, you need liver synthetic dysfunction. Esophageal or gastric viruses or bleeding thereof just require portal hypertension to be there, even if your liver synthetic function is okay. Other complications like sarcopenia or muscle wasting, you need liver synthetic dysfunction even if you don't have portal hypertension. And uh, for pedal edema to happen, you need usually liver synthetic dysfunction. For hepatic encephalopathy to occur, you usually need both. Uh, portal hypertension um, so that the, the, the unfiltered blood with toxins reaches the brain, but usually you also need a component of liver synthetic dysfunction. So that's how we kind of glean between the differences and determine exactly what is going on in the liver. And is uh, hepatocellular carcinoma also considered one of the complications or is, is that kind of a separate entity that gets uh, uh, rolled up in just the workup of all patients with CLD? No, absolutely. It's a great point. Hepatocellular carcinoma is a very important complication of cirrhosis. It is directly tied to development of cirrhosis, and 9 out of 10 people presenting with liver cancer in the United States will have underlying cirrhosis. Um, and that's primarily linked to a faulty regeneration in the liver, because when the liver gets really badly damaged, it tries to regenerate, but when the regeneration is defective, it causes dysplasia and uh, predisposes to cancer. Also, there are certain agents which are directly carcinogenic to the liver. So the hepatitis C virus, the hepatitis B virus, especially because it gets integrated into the DNA of the cell, alcohol, diabetes, obesity, are direct carcinogens. So just taking a slight left turn into HCC, I'm interested to, to know how are you guys at your institution diagnosing HCC? And uh, specifically, I'm interested in knowing if uh, biopsy uh, plays a role in the diagnosis. That's a great question. 
So let me answer the second part. Biopsy is not required for diagnosis of HCC. It is a imaging diagnosis. In fact, we discourage biopsy majority of the time for two reasons. One is uh, HCC is a very vascular tumor, and by biopsying, you can spread it by, by intraperitoneal spread through bleeding. Uh, secondly, the, there is a high false negative uh, rate. 95 to 98 percent of the time, a multiphasic MRI with all its sequences and a restricted diffusion imaging can diagnose an HCC. If the patient is not a good candidate for an MRI, like for example, if they have an MRI unfriendly pacemaker or they have a severely claustrophobic or other things, then we employ a quadruple phase CT. And between the two, we can diagnose HCC 98% of, uh, of the time. I think that's one thing that kind of gets lost in the community is that pathology can oftentimes not be as specific as uh, clinical laboratory and imaging uh, diagnosis of HCC. Can you speak a little bit about that? Do you have any idea exactly what the, the sensitivity and specificity of like a percutaneous biopsy for HCC looks like? And, and I, I'm imagining it can vary from institution, um, but if you have any idea, roughly. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, a percutaneous biopsy for HCC uh, is about 90% sensitive and specific. So it, it, it's, it's up there. However, it is less accurate than an imaging study, and it is fraught with the risk of causing seeding of the tumor uh, and bleeding complications, and therefore we, we, we avoid it. Um, we have biomarkers, like most commonly we use the alpha fetoprotein, but we have some new biomarkers like the descarboxyprothrombin, and then we are working because we are a big research institute. We have a few biomarkers that are currently in development, which we are using in concert with imaging tests so as to improve the accuracy, completely non-invasive. We also call it as a liquid biopsy. Hmm, interesting. Um, what are some of those markers? So there are, there are some methylated genetic markers, and they're still currently in development, so they're, they're, uh, their composition is a little bit proprietary. Uh, but you know you'll you'll be hearing about them uh, in the next hopefully in the next couple of years. But the the ones which are currently available are alpha fetoprotein and also there's a subcomponent of the AFP called as the lens culinaris fraction or AFPL3. If that is elevated, that is really very specific for AFP. And then in patients who do not express an elevated AFP, we use a descarboxyprothrombin which is also in Asia. It, is, it was developed in Asia and Japan, also called as protein induced by vitamin K absence or antagonism, called as PIVCA. And that's, uh, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a really useful marker. It's commercially available in the United States. Okay, excellent. Um, I'll try and link to some of those because I, I can't speak for all the listeners, but um, some of those are very new to me. And I'll just try and get a list from you and we'll post those in the show notes. That'll be interesting. Oh, wow. um, all right, so... Let's talk a little bit about um, portal hypertension and ascites management. Um, how common of a problem is uh, portal hypertension and ascites in your patient population? Sure. So pretty much every patient with cirrhosis at some point in their lifespan will develop portal hypertension if they already don't have it. Uh, so it is kind of ubiquitous. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, ascites is the most common and the most ominous sign of cirrhosis and liver failure, primarily because it is a manifestation of both liver synthetic dysfunction and portal hypertension. It takes two of those underlying conditions for one to develop ascites. So once you have a diagnosis of ascites, can you talk a little bit about what the workup looks like as far as diagnosing like the underlying cause? And and then we'll kind of move into treatment algorithms. Um, so yeah, can you speak a little bit to like if you have a patient who is is new to you but also presents with ascites, like what that means in terms of their workup specifically for them? Sure, absolutely. So when we when we look at ascites, let me divide this into two broad areas. One is a patient who I already know and have diagnosed to have cirrhosis and liver failure. And two is what you alluded to, somebody I meet in the emergency room or somebody who comes to my office brand new with just ascites and have no, has no other evidence 
or predisposition for liver failure. Their workup is entirely different. In somebody who already has established cirrhosis and, and liver failure, the only thing we do in terms of ascites uh, workup is their basic labs, and then when we do a parasynthesis, we will check uh, their albumin and their cell count. And that's it. The, we do not check anything else because it is not really required. Now, on the other hand, if uh, I have a patient who I see in the emergency room who comes with sudden onset of large volume ascites, I will look for many other things, including could this be from a gastrointestinal malignancy, meaning peritoneal carcinomatosis, because these patients may be hale and hearty till two weeks ago and then suddenly just develop ascites and they have no idea what's going on and just come to the emergency room and we may find they have like a colorectal or a gallbladder or pancreatic malignancy, which is usually quite ominous. Absolutely. No, I, I like the idea of like breaking it into big, broad categories, those who you know are known cirrhotics versus the unknown ascites. And, and I mean, like you said, the, the workup is very different for both. Right. Um, so let's talk about some of the treatment of ascites. From, from an interventional radiology perspective, you know, I always think of three things. I think of diuretics, which is uh, not something I typically manage, uh, paracentesis, and then uh, tip procedure. Can you speak a little bit about to how you approach the management of patients with ascites? Absolutely. So uh, when patients have mild or moderate ascites, which means that their be- I can feel the ascites, but their belly is not tense. Uh, and if they have a lot of pedal edema, I will usually start them with a combination of furosemide and spironolactone, which is a you know a loop diuretic uh, as well as a potassium sparing diuretic and salt restriction, and may be able to manage it 70 to 80 percent of the time. Now uh, take the other scenario where somebody just comes with tense societies, their abdominal wall is stretched, their, their umbilicus is reverted, and they are usually very uncomfortable. In addition to starting them on diuretics, I will usually either uh, I will perform a paracentesis uh, in the office and remove eight to ten liters of fluid along with intravenous albumin. Now, in patients who are requiring paracentesis on a weekly basis and their liver is still kind of salvageable, which means and we manage we monitor this with or measure this by looking at their MEL score and so on and so forth then those are suitable candidates for placement of a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. And then we have some experimental therapies that are coming up for management of ascites as well. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, diuretics and how often when you're trying to get your patients dialed in on diuretics. And so you're, you're increasing your diuretics and let's just assume renal function is, is staying stable. How often do you tweak the diuretics to get the level of ascites managed appropriately. Does that make sense? So, you know, you start them out on something, but you're, you're finding that maybe you've turned them from, you know, a weekly or uh, every two week paracentesis to every month. Like when do you make, how often are you seeing these patients to like in, either increase or, or add different diuretics to the regimen? Absolutely. No, that's a great question. So we, I, I see them every one or two weeks initially. Okay. Because when we start them off, um, that's when oftentimes some patients are very sensitive to diuretics. We want to make sure that their potassium, their sodium, and creatinine is okay. Uh, so I'll bring them. Usually, we do not escalate diuretics by more than one week at a time, unless unless they are inpatients. If they are inpatients, then all bets are off, and we make those changes on a daily basis because we are monitoring them so closely. So otherwise, it is one to two weeks. We look at their weight. We look at their pedal edema. So, for instance, if the pedal edema is gone, but the ascites is still large, those patients, we are very wary of increasing diuretics because those patients are at a high risk of developing hepatorenal syndrome. And those patients also tend to run a low borderline blood pressure. So you have to be very alert, very wary, and very mindful of everything that's going on around them because diuretics are clearly a very double-edged sword. I mean, they're very helpful, but slight mismanagement in them can be very unforgiving. Right. And how about on patients who you originally try a diuretic regimen and they don't tolerate it very well, like say you see uh, bumps uh, in their creatinine and and decrease in their GFR, can you 
can you back off their diuretics? And then is there ever, are there opportunities to come back to increasing those diuretics? Like after, after you've had some time to like establish a new equilibrium, like say you have a new patient, you're escalating diuretics, and then you have to back off. Can you, can you work then tr- attempt later on to work your way back up into those diuretics? Most certainly, most certainly. Okay. Play this ping pong game with diuretics all the time because, um, you know, so one week I may scale them down, next week uh, I may go back up. Uh, the kidney function is very, very critical in cirrhotic patients because uh, once uh, hepatorenal syndrome uh, sets in and if we are not very mindful to these uh, to making these adjustments, these patients can go downhill very, very rapidly. And so we make these changes all the time. Sometimes if the creatinine has gone up rapidly, I will put them in the hospital and give them some intravenous albumin. What it does is, is it increases the colloid oncotic pressure. By doing that, it improves the renal perfusion. And therefore, uh, and then we are able to reset the diuretics to a point where these patients can uh, effectively lose that extra amount of extracellular fluid. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, I think there's always a patient that we struggle with, and it's the patient who doesn't tolerate diuretics particularly well, and you're seeing in the office um, every week, uh, sometimes more than every, or sometimes twice a week for repeat paracentesis. And can you talk a little bit about why these patients uh, pose such a challenge to us? And and is there a way to troubleshoot it? Is there, is there a way to limit um, these patients, or not limit these patients, but is there a way to better manage these patients? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And that's the the patient population you're talking about is easily at least a third of all the cirrhotics with ascites that we manage. So it is a very, very common problem. And so uh, there are a few things that uh, we have to be very mindful of. Like the most important thing, if the patient keeps developing rapid accumulation of ascites, despite diuretics, and we look at their feet and they're not swollen, meaning the edema is gone, those patients almost invariably need something more than diuretics, meaning consideration of a shunt or a transplant. I mean, hopefully they've already been prepared for that. Uh, Two is the patients with a borderline low blood pressure, because in those patients, the renal arteries are vasoconstricted, and so the diuretics will not work as, uh, as well, and those patients also go at risk of going into renal failure. Three is the patients with severe muscle wasting. Because they have a lot of uh, uh, muscle wasting, it's an indirect uh, statement assessment that they have very poor colloid oncotic pressure. And when you have poor colloid oncotic pressure, the diuretics are not able to extrapolate all that extracellular fluid volume. So if you imagine a patient who's muscle wasted, got a creatinine of 1.6, uh, has a blood pressure of 95 or 60, and is here for the second paracentesis either in the IR lab or in the uh, in the hepatology office, I know that this person is invariably going to need something more than the, the regular diuretic management, and we'll have to go over and beyond to figure out what else we can do for this patient. So without having too many specifics about the patient, I, I guess, like, what is that? What else is there to do? Um, and does it, I mean, I'm sure it can vary between patient, but how do, you, how do you approach that and begin to troubleshoot it? So, I mean, of course, initially we make the assessment whether the patient is a transplant candidate, we evaluate them, and if they are and they are eligible, put them on the list. So, so sometimes it would be wait list management. And suppose if they are not transplant candidates, um, you know, after we've looked at their initial cause, made sure that they are abstinent from alcohol, diabetes control, and so on and so forth. When we go to the granular details on how to manage the ascites, basically there are really two options. One is whether they are suitable for placement of a TIPS or whether we can just tap them on a weekly basis, uh, you know, using um, machines or equipment like Renova, uh, where we can get a lot of fluid out of their Uh, abdomen uh, fairly rapidly and safely um, as an alternative to to tips while they are either waiting for transplant or other things. And is a Denver shunt in the algorithm for the treatment of these patients? uh, Or do you guys have any experience with um, having patients referred for uh, the shunts? A Denver shunt is almost obsolete because of the very high risk of infections and uh, uh, DIC. What we we do we are uh, we do have a research protocol using 
an alpha pump where there's a catheter placed into the bladder from the peritoneal cavity, and uh, that uh, that has some promise. Uh, in patients who are very terminally ill, who are not transplant candidates, we do put a plurex catheter in them where, you know, they can just drain this at home. Usually those are patients who have a life expectancy of three months or, or, or so. But uh, for all practical purposes, the only shunt we would use is a transregular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. Gotcha. One, I haven't heard of, I, I forgot what you, uh, the alpha pump that, that basically is peritoneal to bladder. I haven't heard of that. Um, is this relatively new? Is this something the urologists do? No, no, no. This is something that is done by our surgeons and okay. so radiologists. It has been uh, in Europe for the last uh, year or so. And, uh, you know, I uh, started a clinical trial with it about six months ago. Uh, and so there are a few sites in the U.S. doing it. Going back to the paracentesis, is there a limit to um, how much volume you will take off for a patient either who is new to you or a patient that you see for recurrent ascites on a weekly or you know every two-week basis? That's a great question, and it totally depends. So the most important uh, determinant is their kidney function. If the, if the, if the GFR is less than 30, 30, then we typically do not want to remove more than six liters of, uh, of uh, fluid, and we will always give them intravenous albumin. So our practice, as well as that of our IR colleagues, is if anybody requires more than four liters of paracentesis, we give them intravenous albumin, 10 gram per liter of fluid removed in order to avoid a condition called as post-paracentesis circulatory dysfunction, which leads to kidney failure and can be very catastrophic. So that's kind of the rule of thumb. Uh, in patients who have normal kidney function and have a normal blood pressure, I could potentially remove, remove up to 15 liters of fluid as long as I'm very particular, very diligent about the albumin. So if I remove 15 liters of fluid, I'll give them 150 grams of IV albumin. And then, of course, everybody else in between. So actually, I'd, I did want to drill down on your uh, protocol for albumin. And you did, you gave a good example with like removing 15 liters, but uh, just to repeat it with uh, maybe some numbers that might be a little uh, more reasonable for people to follow. So if you go uh, six liters off and you're going to give albumin 60 grams of albumin? Correct. Yes, exactly. Okay. And then anything below four liters just doesn't warrant albumin. All right. Anything below four liters, you can get away without, without uh, use of IV albumin. Okay. Because you won't go wrong with IV albumin. Uh, but the, the logistics have to be taken into consideration. I mean, does the patient have an IV? Does they have good veins? Is you know, uh, cost and so on and so forth. But um, but majority, overwhelming majority of the time, we will give IV albumin during the paracentesis. It's just good. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And one thing that I wanted to go back to, um, and I, I know it's obvious to people who do a lot of portal hypertension work, but just for some of our maybe uh, listeners who are trainees. Can you talk a little bit about why a uh, a plurex or a tunnel peritoneal drain is not a great idea in someone who is not end of life? No, that's a great question. I'm asked, I'm glad you asked that. Well, there are two reasons. One is that the risk of infection is almost 100% because um, the fluid inside the abdominal cavity in patients with ascites is very, very prone to infections. It has low albumin. It is low on opsonization. Uh, and these patients get very, they are very prone to infections. And then, of course, you know, there is a portal from the skin which causes them to have severe infections. The second thing is when patients go home with a plurex catheter, of course, they are not able to give intravenous albumin. And so uh, they eventually succumb to severe circulatory dysfunction, kidney failure, which eventually leads to death. Can you talk, uh, and this is not something that, that comes up all the time, but do you have any troubleshooting tips for uh, patients who have a lot of leakage after you do paracentesis, like they just leak from the stick site? That's a great question. In fact, just yesterday I was vetting a, a new research project on this uh, on this issue. It is a very common problem. The, there are three ways to mitigate it. Uh, one is uh, we use dermabond. So the dermabond we found is very helpful. It is very minimally irritant to the skin. Um, uh, second, you can do actually a circlage stitch if it is like a really big opening, and our, our interventional radiologists do that a lot. Thirdly, and this is, you know, if, if these patients are 
in a place which is not a tertiary referral center and I just get a call from an ER in East Texas saying that they have a patient who's leaking out ascites. Till they come to see me, I'll just ask them to put a colostomy bag. And then fourthly, um, the best treatment when these patients have a large amount of ascites and there's leaking out is to do another paracentesis because the leakage is due to excessive pressure in the abdomen. And if you can tap them dry, then the leakage will automatically go away. Right. And then you can get some, yeah, right. If you can just keep that, the original stick site from leaking, if you can just dry it up and allow it a chance to crust over and um, yeah, get a scab over it, that's helpful. All right. So uh, I think we uh, tackled a lot. Um, one of the things that I wanted to discuss was prognostic indicators. How helpful do you find, or are you tracking um, patients with, uh, you mentioned earlier that you use the MELD score and the child Pew score for diagnosing, um, but is this something you track regularly as like patients are routinely being seen, or is it something that uh, once you've had it once and you've had their baseline, then it's more of a clinical surveillance than uh, tracking these scores? Sure. So the child Pew score, we usually track when we are managing a liver cancer or the patient requires a non-hepatic surgery. So, for example, if a cirrhotic patient needs a hip surgery, then uh, I will, you know, need to know whether they are child PUA, B, or C. Other than that, uh, we don't use it that often. The MEL score is supremely important because it has a direct correlation with mortality. And it has a direct correlation with the need and assessment for transplant as well as uh, the ability to undergo a TIPS, for example, in patients with refractory ascites. So uh, the U.S. average, I mean, we typically will perform a transplant evaluation in somebody whose MELD score is greater than 15. And that is also the norm which is used by insurance companies because at that point, the mortality from the liver disease exceeds the mortality from a transplant. Uh, and then if the MELD score gra goes greater than 20, then we check that, you know, every, every couple of weeks. And if it is more than 25, we check it every week if they are on the list, because that's how their number or their rank on the maturin list is. It also helps us determine, uh, for example, the ability to do a TIPS on somebody. So if the MEL score is more than 15, I would be very kind of reluctant to do a TIPS unless the patient is already listed for a liver transplant. If the MELD is more than 20, uh, then I would not do it at all. Sure. Switching gears a little bit, um, from these prognostic indicators and more to uh, transplant. Is, is there some advice you can give to uh, physicians in the community or people who aren't at transplant centers? Is there a way, first, can you talk about um, a way to plug patients in with uh, a local uh, referring plant tra uh, transplant center? And then I'm going to ask you some follow-up questions about uh, just some transplant basics. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for the listeners in the community, I think it is really important to have a, a relationship with your a transplant center because a, uh, patients with liver disease can deteriorate very rapidly and the deterioration can often be catastrophic. And uh, folks at transplant centers like ours usually want, want to have very close community liaisons with these, uh, uh, with the, these providers so we can you know, bring them at the drop of a hat, either inpatient or, uh, or, or our outpatient or uh, information uh, is usually on websites. We have the Liver Institute Texas dot uh, uh, com, and uh, you know, and depending on where you are, we have satellite locations which are all over the uh, the metroplex to help uh, serve serve these uh, uh, patients as as well as their needs. And so, I think the key thing is if you if if your patient has started showing signs of hepatic decompensation, which is ascites. Edema had one episode of bleeding from viruses, hepatic encephalopathy, muscle wasting, or jaundice. I think those are the signs that should alert you to get them plugged in into your closest uh, uh, liver transplant uh, center. If that helps. Yeah, I'm happy that you mentioned the satellite locations because I think one of the barriers for people in the community and, and oftentimes rural community are that um, you know these patients have to come from a, a really far away and they may have limited means. And so taking uh, a day off of work or, or just taking uh, the resources needed to get to a transplant center can be very taxing. And, and sometimes there are uh, satellite locations where you don't have to go to the mothership to actually get worked up. So moving a little bit to just a, a transplant assessment, are there any tips that you could give patients in the community 
as far as like being able to like does every patient who potentially could are, are there any patients who it's not worth their time to go to a transplant center because there's no way they would be a transplant candidate do you, does that make sense yeah absolutely absolutely well so for my my tips to the patients would be twofold one is uh you know oftentimes i've had patients who felt that they were not transplant candidates because of their age or something like that, and they were excellent transplant candidates. So my advice to patients would be: you let us, you let your liver team uh, decide and make those judgments on your behalf, because we do an extensive workup and make those determinations. But in order to prep patients best for consideration of transplant, there are three or four things that are supremely important that will help them become better transplant candidates. And this is, of course, you know, apart from the obvious, which is staying away from uh, any, you know, uh, toxins like alcohol and so on and so forth, and good care of their health, especially diabetes control. But really in liver failure, food is medicine. So I advise patients to eat multiple meals a day, a high protein diet up to 100 grams a day, eat a bedtime snack, because this will maintain their anabolic rate, prevent muscle mass. Encourage them to do a physical activity, walk as much as possible, uh, maybe 20, 30 minutes, two or three times a week if they can, even if they can get a family member to go with them if they feel the balance is off. Three is uh, having a very important family support system. Uh, the, a transplant is something that cannot be done by a patient themselves. They need help. So I encourage patients that don't fight this battle on, on your own inform your fa close family members uh, and uh, see what kind of help you can mobilize um, uh, from them. And, and then uh, finally, to keep a close network of doctors. They're being in touch with their primary care physician, their gastroenterologist, their hepatologist, their transplant center, uh, and uh, that helps us communicate and, and cut all the, all the loose ends, uh, tie all the loose ends uh, uh, well. Okay, excellent. All right, um, Parvez, I think that we've done a really good job. I, I really think that, um, you know, it was a broad topic and uh, you did a good job uh, with me, like, you know, kind of diving into this, what can be a pretty daunting overview of, you know, chronic liver disease and specifically portal hypertension. Are there any uh, favorite papers or references that you can recommend to our trainee audience or people who are just more interested in knowing more about chronic liver disease and portal hypertension management specifically? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, and there's tons of, of papers. What, but I would recommend... Yeah, but what are, like, what are like the three best papers? You know, if I had to like put the screws to you, like what are your favorite papers on it? Absolutely, absolutely. So the ASLD practice guidelines, which are published in hepatology, um, and I think the last publication was in 2019, uh, and then the white paper on the management of hepatocellular carcinoma, from uh, hepatology uh, are some of the best uh, papers. And then there is a paper on the management of ascites, the guidelines set about by the International uh, Ascites uh, Club. Uh, so th those would be the three top uh, uh, papers I would recommend uh, uh, for both the trainees as well as you know, cu curious patients, primary care physicians, or even, uh, or, or even radiologists, if you'd like a deeper dive into this disease. Yeah, excellent. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, we loved having you. Thank you for your time. Uh, it was my pleasure, Chris, and thank you for having me on the show. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Uh, to our audience, thank you for listening. If you guys enjoyed the podcast but want more, please check out the show notes on this episode. Those can be found at www.backtable.com. We're usually one week out from publishing the show to getting the show notes. Um, we will make sure that we have any links to any articles that were referenced during the show. If you enjoy the podcast and want to support the show, here are two easy ways. First, take one second, press the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening on. This helps platforms like iTunes or Spotify know that you, our audience, value what we're doing and you're interested in getting our latest content as we're producing it. Second, if you're really getting value from these podcasts, please go to iTunes, leave us a short written review. This helps us in so many different ways. Plus, we love getting the feedback. That wraps things up. We'll see you next time on the Back Table Podcast.